Hi, I'm Stephanie Pedersen, President and Editor of the News Tribune and Washington State Regional Editor for McClatchy. Thanks for joining us for this discussion about disinformation in local elections. America's architects view the press as essential to our democracy, including it in the first article of our Bill of Rights. And yet today, we are testing what a post-news world looks like with consistent attacks on credible information. Factual reporting is being replaced by Russian bots that publish false information to our social media feeds. But local journalists and Washington news organizations continue to do fact-based reporting seven days a week, all hours of the day. The reporting on how the coronavirus is impacting us and how school districts are responding to the challenge. And just yesterday, we launched our voter guide where you can find the races on your ballot by entering your address and comparing candidates. We have never had more people reading our stories and viewing videos because local news has never been more important. If we're going to tackle disinformation, we have to start here and you can help. Today, we will share examples of false information and strategies for spotting it as you look to make the best possible decisions for your community come November. We will give you a roadmap for spotting false claims and help you learn how to set the record straight. We've brought together disinformation experts from academia and technology and local reporters to discuss how we can navigate with confidence an election unlike any other. Before we begin, many thanks to you for making the time to join us today or watching on demand. Thanks for investing in local news, for sharing questions ahead of time. We've incorporated many of them in today's three sessions. You'll leave our time together with tools that will enable you to spot disinformation and to effectively navigate conversations with others about what is fact and fiction. We ask in return that you encourage others to support local news. Send them the link and ask them to subscribe. The more, subs the more subscribers continue to grow, the more news we can get to. So let's move into our first session. Please welcome the News Tribune's Matt Driscoll, a columnist and reporter who's passionate about the city of destiny and strives to tell stories that might otherwise go untold. He's joined by Matt Mysterick, the editorial page editor at the News Tribune, where he was a local news editor for 12 years before taking over the editorial pages in 2016. Thank you both for being here. Thanks for having me. Mr. Driscoll, we'll start with you. Um, let's first start off by differentiating between news reporting and columnist. And what does that mean in journalism? How can readers tell the difference? Yeah, and it's a uh, it's a good question to ask, uh, largely because I know it's a item of confusion for many readers because we hear it all the time, and I, I hear it all the time as a, as a columnist. So I think uh, the important place to start with this is uh, journalism, whether it's opinion writing, which has existed in journalism for a long time, or straight news reporting, it kind of starts at the same place, which is the fact gathering, the actual rigors of journalism, the actual reporting. So whether you're writing a straight news story or whether you're doing what I do, which is uh, write opinion columns, write columns with voice, it starts from the basis of reporting, which is gathering the facts, talking to sources, talking to experts, uh, all, all the, the general rigors of, of journalism. From there, for me uh, and for columnist, it, it, you go into a place of inserting your opinion or your view of, or your voice. Now, sometimes the columns that I write have a very strong and obvious opinion to them. Sometimes it's it's a little less so, but always it's my voice and in injecting myself as the writer into what I'm publishing. So as a, as a columnist, that's the difference between what you're getting from me and what you're getting from straight news reporting. Uh, how people can uh, differentiate be between the two, uh, you know, I think that's something that we can help them with. Uh, you know, back when there was, uh, you know, it, the newspaper on your doorstep was kind of the only game in town. It was, it was a lot clearer and easier for people to to see the difference now with so many different sources online, uh, it does get a little tricky for folks, I, I, I believe. So, you know, in print, I think we do a good job of establishing that it's commentary. You know, when you see my name, you see that it's commentary online. I think we do an even better job when you get to the page. It, you know, it clearly states that I'm a columnist. Uh, and hopefully, I think we can do a better job of letting people know what that means and kind of continuing that conversation. Because like I said at the beginning, uh, I know as, uh, as, as difficult as it is for, for me or other columnists to, to deal with sometimes, it's a question we get all the time. 
Right. Uh, and, you know, for the editorial board, it, it's sort of the same, same sort of questions. Uh, Mr. Masaryk, you were once on the news editing side and uh, have been a part of our editorial team for a few years. What is the value in having an editorial board and, and what voice does it represent? Yeah, thanks, Stephanie. Um, you're right. A vast majority of my career was spent on the news side, um, including at the News Tribune. It was, I'm now in my fifth year as an editorial page editor at the News Tribune. And it was a, a hard transition, I'll admit it, um, back in 2016. Um, all my career and in, in my college training, um, I was geared and um, trained to be purely objective um, and to put all, all opinion aside. Um, and then all of a sudden, uh, five years ago, I was thrust in the idea where, in, into a situation where I have to wear my opinions on my sleeve and, and, and write about it, just share them just about every day. Um, and even when I was in the newsroom, I didn't know quite to, what to make of the editorial board thing. I sometimes wondered if they were just off on their own island, you know, practicing some sort of opinion journalism, mystical arts or something. So um, it was a transition, but it's one I'm glad I made. And, and here's why. I, I do think the editorial board in, in some ways, well, I've, I've heard it said that they're the conscience, they can be the conscience of the community. Um, I don't know if I'd quite go that far. Um, that kind of sounds uh, monolithic or all-knowing. Um, and sometimes we can kind of fall into the, the finger wagging mode, including lots of woulds and shoulds and musts. Um, but I, to be honest with you, what I like about it is we're really, if we are a community conscience, we're a conscience of five, or actually five people, um, most of the year in six during election season. And, you know, we challenge each other. Um, we test each other. We um, we uh, we sharpen each other's opinions. We draw out each other's opinions that many of us, as, as trained journalists, have suppressed for <laughs> for a long time. Um, and most importantly, I think um, we work together to get the facts straight. Since we're talking about disinformation today, I would be remiss not to mention that. But five or six people are are better at combating any. Uh, disinformation creep that that can come uh, into your into your journalism. Um, and I appreciate that. Just a real quick example, um, a lab, just from last week, you know, we're in the middle of endorsement season, which is probably one of the most important things we do. We've, we've, we, we take it seriously. A week ago, uh, we, we had an endorsement that we were going to publish with a series of other legislative endorsements. Uh, we ended up making the decision to hold it 24 hours. Um, because we hadn't quite figured out if some of the facts involving a candidate and something he may or may not have done 25 years ago were true. Um, and we wanted to continue to debate whether we wanted to endorse him or his opponent or, or nobody in that race. Well, we decided to hold the endorsement 24 hours and, you know, people will still question or second guess whether we made the right decision. But um, because we're a group, um, we were able to, to come to that conclusion together. Great. Thanks for that. Uh, Matt Driscoll, you know, even though you're columnists and, and, and editorial writers here with us today, uh, you use some of the same tools that reporters, most of the same tools that reporters use. What are those that you use to find accurate information? Right. I think uh, maybe from a public standpoint, there there's some uncertainty about what journalism entails. You know, I think Mr. Mysteric there mentioned a, a kind of a dark art aspect to it. And I think maybe in the general public, there's some uh, kind of mystery about what we do. But really, it's it's journalism at its root is, is a trade. Uh, you, you, there, there's a, there are steps and rigors that you learn uh, as you do this. Uh, you know, I, I generally learn from experience, but certainly in journalism school, uh, it's something that that's taught from the very beginning about how you go about uh, collecting accurate information and how you use it. Uh, so a lot of the things that we utilize, they'd probably be a little onerous for the general public to, to, to use, but they're, they're not mysterious. They are making, filing public record re requests and, uh, getting information that way. They are, uh, talking to sources, talking to prime sources, uh, talking to multiple sources, corroborating stories, uh, making sure you're talking to everyone involved and, and, and making sure that what you're hearing is accurate and, and, and going back to make sure that you hear what you're hearing is accurate. Um, it involves uh, 
you know, corroborating uh, reporting that you're reading, not just relying on on one source. Uh, one kind of timely example of that, um, in my mind, would be the coverage of uh, President Trump's uh, COVID uh, treatment over over the weekend. Uh, New York Times, Wall Street Journal, I'm, they were both clearly reporting the uh, situation accurately, but if you read both, they came with a different kind of tenor or temperature to it, where the New York Times kind of was focusing more on the some of the uncertainty and the contradictions about what was going on. And the Wall Street Journal uh, was a much more straightforward approach that uh, included the same information, but it was a little bit different spin um, or, or context, not spin, but context. So I think uh, just making sure you're doing your legwork and you're checking all those boxes that you learn uh, in journalism school or you learn from on the job doing it um, that prevent you from having that uh, moment where you you wake up in the middle of the night with a rush of adrenaline because you you forgot something but you know there's a there's a there are kind of boxes that you can check as, could, because it is a trade it's not there's nothing mysterious about it that if you kind of check all those boxes and make sure uh, you're doing the legwork um, you know what you produce is uh, journalism that people can trust and that's what we strive to do every day um we have some great questions uh, readers have asked, so I want to jump right into a, a few of these. Matt Mysteric, we'll let you take this one. David asks, do you think the state and county voters pamphlets are free from disinformation and a good, reliable source of voter information? Uh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, there really is no single source of information out there that that people should use. Really, they should draw from a variety of information. Heck, I'll even admit, don't just use our endorsements this time of year. I mean, we are, we, we do the, the, the best we can. Uh, our endorsements are nothing more than a recommendation, but, um, you know, we're six people in the community. We, between the six of us, we have well over a hundred years uh, of life here. We chose chosen to live here and raise our families here, and we have an affection for this community. And so we take it seriously. That being said, um, people should use multiple sources. And that does include the voters pamphlet for sure. Um, but I would say even, you know, with the voters pamphlet too, um, ca caveat emptor, uh, buyer beware, even though it's free, buyer beware. There is, um, you know, I will look at the voters pamphlet for sure before I vote. And I think everybody should, there's good information in there, but I'll, I'm just going to give you an example in, from our current election that, that should show you that you need to kind of take these things with a grain of salt. Um, in our state uh, school superintendent's race this year, um, uh, the challenger um, made a statement against the incumbent, and um, which turned out to, uh, to be and an submitted for the voters pamphlet. Uh, Thurston County judge intervened and determined that it was false, that it was defamatory, and that it should be not included in the voters pamphlet. Um, long story short, it got taken to the Supreme Court, state Supreme Court, and state Supreme Court said, didn't really actually rule on whether it was false or not. What they ruled on was that um, it was unlikely that the incumbent in this case would be able to establish um, actual malice um, under you know, a US Supreme Court president, precedent. So um, it's gonna be that, that material that one judge, trial court judge said was defamatory will be in our voters pamphlet this year in that race. Um, so it's an example of, you've got to take these things with a grain of salt um, and um, some some material in the voters pamphlet. I mean, heck, this, this material is provided by people whose ambition here is to get elected. There is certainly some scrutiny um, in auditor's offices, but, um, but under free speech protections, uh, a lot of material gets in and some of it may not be true. And that's a great transition for Dale's question that we have here. Uh, Matt Driscoll, we'll let you take this one. Is there any legislative action that can be taken to prevent the weaponization of the First Amendment? And if so, how can we safeguard against, how can that be safeguarded against by those who propagate untruths? Right. Well, I mean, that's really one of the questions of the moment, isn't it? And unfortunately, uh, while I'm, you know, eager to hear what some of the other members of this panel today might have to say on the subject, I think the answer that I'm going to unfortunately provide is going to be a little bit unsatisfying because when we talk about uh, legislative legislative solutions to uh, speech, it gets really tricky because of, uh, you know, our constitutional rights and free speech. I think that uh, legislating 
speech historically, um, even under the best of uh, intentions, is very, very difficult for a very, very good reason uh, because of those uh, constitutional protections. What I think has been uh, perhaps more successful, if not far too slow in coming, has been uh, pressure on some of the uh, Facebooks and Twitters of the world to do a better job of kind of reining in uh, this sort of speech or, you know, this sort of um, misinformation that is, you know, we know we all know is spread so readily on those those platforms. Uh, recently, I was uh, reading about efforts from Facebook and, and Twitter to uh, cut down on uh, the spread of the QAnon conspiracy, and uh, Twitter had enacted some some regulation or, or so, cut down on on, on uh, profiles that were known to spread this information, and it had cut down by half already. But then you get the other side of that, which is uh, we already know that uh, people who are active in the circles are always already talking about it and already devising ways to get around that because you know it's speech and it's very difficult so if you know you don't mention q anon uh can you talk about uh, child sex trafficking probably um so it's very very difficult and any of us uh, from a legislative perspective any of us old enough to remember the uh you know the backpage.com uh situation know that i mean th in that situation you had a platform that was you know pretty clearly involved in uh sex trafficking, and yet that battle waged in court for years and years uh, while Backpage continued to, to, to partake in that uh, activity because it is so difficult to, uh, you know, kind of legislate or uh, uh, rein in the, uh, the, you know, free speech, and understandably so. So I think the, the real answer to that question, at least from my perspective, uh, comes from uh, putting pressure on some of the big tech companies like the Facebooks and the Twitters of the world to just do a better job. Thanks. Uh, we'll get one more reader question in for this segment, and I'll let you both have an opportunity to answer. We'll start with Matt Mysteric here from Susan. She asks, what are the best and most unbiased fact-checking sites that you use? Yeah, thanks for that. Um, I'd say PolitiFact is a good one uh, nationally. Um, that, that's one that I turn to a lot. Um, you know, locally, it, it's, it's harder to come by. Um, but I would say nationally, PolitiFact is a good one. Yeah, um, I, I also agree nationally, PolitiFact is one I use. And I wish there was just a, a Google for fact checking that we could uh, send people to, to uh, uh, you know, where they could fill in their answer and get the, get the question immediately, because boy, wouldn't that be helpful. Uh, you know, locally, uh, I, I think the work we do here at the News Tribune uh, often serves a, as a fact check. I think we do try to do as ma many of those stories as possible. And I'd be remiss not to uh, give a local shout out to Snopes, which is based right here in Tacoma. Uh, I think people have some, uh, you know, I think different opinions about what Snopes is, but uh, in certain instances, whether when you're looking to uh, debunk a uh, particularly ridiculous claim online, Snopes usually does a pretty good job doing that. Okay. Thank you both for your time and answering those important questions as we navigate this election. For our second segment, we're going to discuss how to identify disinformation and why we're susceptible to these campaigns. It's my honor to introduce Dr. Kate Hoyt, an assistant professor at Pacific Lutheran University in the Department of Communication. Her research interests include critical technology studies or how media technologies implicate social hierarchies and manifestations of power digital forms of protest and digital media and information literacy, or how digital citizens assess the credibility of web circulated information. Welcome, Kate. Thank you. Next is Dr. Seth Weinberger, a professor of politics and government at the University of Puget Sound. He teaches courses on international relations, US foreign policy, international security, political philosophy, and conspiracy theories and fake news. His current research focuses on the decentralized structures of modern day extremist groups with a particular focus on US based organizations. Thanks for being here, Seth. Thanks so much for having me. All right, Kate, let's start simple. How can people improve their media literacy? How do they know that they can trust what they're reading? Um, well, I think there's a number of things that folks can do. Um, I think, uh, my, the, the answers might not be as satisfying because um, 
I think the, the number one thing that folks can do to verify what they're reading is correct is to slow down. Um, and that's not easy to do in the media landscape that we have right now where um, unprecedented volumes of information are being sort of bombarded at us. Um, it's tempting to turn to things like the, you know, the media bias chart um, to look at sort of the political slant uh, of supposed political slant of a certain outlet. Um, but, you know, my problem with that is that it, uh, it sort of outsources critical thinking to others. And um, it also treats uh, individual sources like they're monoliths. Uh, so I think the first thing is when you see something on, uh, on social media, for example, um, don't just go off of the, the post or uh, the, the headline, uh, click on it and take a look at the actual article um, in, on its native website. Um, there are things you can look for um, called trust indicators. And this is a concept that's being developed by the Trust Project out in California. Um, and these are indicators that uh, both con media consumers have uh, indicated that would help them establish greater trust in the media, as well as sort of journalistic best practices. Um, so things like, um, you know, does the does the outlet have a best uh, an ethics and editorial standards statement? Um, do they have a policy on uh, disclosing conflicts of interest or uh, corrections and retractions? Um, this was mentioned earlier by Matt Driscoll, but are there clear labels um, in terms of you know what what information is news based reporting and what information is editorial or opinion? Um, Things like, uh, are there a lot of anonymous sources? Are, are the anonymous sources given a reason why they're anonymous? Um, if there is a publicly available uh, public like, document, like a, a congressional report or something, um, do they link to that? Or do, you, do they sort of rely, have you rely on their interpretation of, of that uh, document? Um, and so all of these things uh, necessarily mean that we have to slow down and actually look at what we're dealing with here. But um, I think that they can be uh, particularly effective in terms of combating misinformation or disinformation when it comes to uh, po political content. Thanks. Seth, what sort of news sources are, are you looking at and, and how are you using them and dissecting them yourself? Uh, well, I certainly agree with everything that Kate said. Slowing down is, is the first point. Um, and, you know, in terms of how you think about what sources you're looking at. The internet, I think, sort of poses us with a unique kind of problem, but that problem is also one of the things that makes the internet such a wonderful place for information and for and for learning things, right? Which is that it, uh, it encourages us to do our own research, to judge for ourselves, and to be our own experts. And that, of course, is fundamentally a good thing, right? For people to be able to explore information uh, to find things for themselves, to, to look at multiple different kinds of information. But that also erodes um, the trust in experts that we have when we're told that we can be the judges, right? We're in a world now in which the sort of, you know, I grew up, I'm not that old, but I grew up in a world in which there were only a few news sources, right? Three three or four channels on TV and, and the, the newspaper would come every day. And that was really the only way you could, you could get information, the radio. Um, now we're in a world in which there are in almost an infinite number of sources. Um, and so you need to think about, you know, what is it you're looking at? Are you looking at an established news source? Are you looking at uh, a major paper? Are you looking at um, something coming out of a, uh, a news station? Are you looking at something published by a, a brand new sort of policy place that maybe has only been around for a little while? Um, that's the first thing is to try to get a sense of who and where your information is coming from. Um, who's being quoted or referenced? Whose research appears in the article? Is it cited? Is it identifiable? Are the people who are being talked about or is the information um, sourced? Uh, you know, uh, mis, dis, mis and disinformation often make claims that are very difficult to track back to their original sources, to somebody who might have done that research uh, or to wherever you can go and actually check and see if what is reported in the article is in fact the actual piece of information. Um, so I would start, you know, I would think about that, being very careful about the kind of information you're looking at, trying to identify uh, who, who published it, who wrote it, 
whose research appears in it. And then um, as both of the, the Matts in the previous segment said, Matt Driscoll and Matt Nesterek said, not just relying on one source. I mean, I'm someone who has to follow international news as a, as a scholar of international politics. You know, so I am very careful to read multiple sources, including pieces of information uh, from places that I suspect I'm not going to agree with, think tanks uh, or um, other kinds of outlets that I know maybe have a, a, a take on um, world events that I'm going to disagree with, right? But that perspective, that that opinion is really useful in trying to understand what is actually happening in the world. So you know, I can't remember the last time that that all my information on something that I that I was that I was interested in came from a single source. Um, so multiple sources, understanding you know who uh, where that information is coming from, who's publishing it. Those are all the things that I think are are important in going into making decisions about the kinds of pieces of information uh, that you want to that that you want to look for and uh, to try to ensure that what you're reading and, and that the, the, the sense that you're getting of the sort of the totality of the story is in fact accurate. And like you both said, we're being bombarded with uh, so many news articles and, and headlines and social media all day, every day. Uh, so that's a, a follow-up question to you. Um, as, you know, we're seeing so much of this. Why are we so susceptible? Why are people so susceptible to disinformation campaigns? Well, I think it really starts with sort of basic human psychology, the way that our brains work. Um, humans want the world to make sense. Uh, our brains have evolved to recognize patterns because that's a valuable um, skill to have in trying to navigate the world, trying to understand things um, and trying to recognize commonalities, trying to recognize patterns. It is how we make sense of the world. So the first thing is we want to see is we want to see patterns. We want to see commonalities. We want to see causation behind things. We also, humans also really dislike the sense that things, uh, and especially bad things, happen for no reason or for reasons that we can't understand. We don't want the world to be random. We want good, pe we want good people to be rewarded and bad people to be punished. We want people to get what they deserve. Uh, and lots of what disinformation does and what makes it so appealing is that it explains events that are maybe random or maybe uh, produce undesirable outcomes in ways that help us be comforted by them and help them fit into our old, um, excuse me, our own worldviews. So for example, if my choice for elected office loses, it's much more comforting for me to get us to believe that, that, that the electoral loss is the result of mail-in fraud or undocumented voters voting rather than my candidate just wasn't preferred by the majority of people who voted, right? That is discomfitting to me because it makes me feel like my opinion is not correct or my opinion is, is unvalued. So I'd much rather, it's much more uh, acceptable to me to have that explained by, um, by some piece of misinformation, disinformation, that there's something nefarious going on. Um, and I guess the last thing that I would just like to add is I think the other reason that disinformation is so powerful is that the internet has really produced a world in which popularity can substitute for veracity, right? What makes things sort of go viral are more likes. The more likes there are, the more people who like something, that makes us feel like that piece of information is more likely to be accurate. We take a lot of comfort in crowds, in the wisdom of the group, right? When you know, we, we, when people we know, when lots of people we know are uh, pushing something or liking it on Facebook or on Instagram, right, that makes us think that that is more likely to be true. And we certainly don't want to stand out from the crowd and disbelieve something. Kate, do you want to add something? Sure. Um, I mean, I think everything that Seth said was absolutely correct. Um, and especially, you know, uh, substituting popularity for veracity um, in today's media landscape. Um, I would say that there are some structural factors uh, that make folks, us, particularly susceptible to misinformation now. Um, you know, public trust in, um, or just the trust in public institutions in general has been on the decline for a number of decades now. Um, and this is probably has to do with how much more information about these institutions are available to us. Um, and there's there's so much information and not enough time to to verify it, and so that's one reason. Um, and I think echoing some of uh, Seth's answers, 
Um, there's there's research that's showing like there's research coming out of USC that suggests that um, when you are uh, attacked or challenged ideologically, um, the same parts of your brain are activated as when you're being attacked uh, politic or sorry uh, physically. Um, so. So it's very much like this kind of primal um, instinct to protect oneself. Um, and, and I think that speaks to a lot of what, what Seth was talking about. But, but yeah, this, this, uh, this need to sort of um, find patterns and find causality um, is, is sort of a stress response. Um, it, is, it is a coping mechanism for stress management. And so I think understanding that there are sort of fun fundamental psychological reasons why we might prefer certain information, even if that information might not be credible, um, goes deep into at the heart of basically human nature. Um, not to say that there isn't anything we can do about it, but um, but that it is um, it is like sort of a common human experience. Thank you. We've heard from our journalists about the tools they use, and uh, but when it comes to deep fakes and elections, we see these campaigns really ramp up. Emotions are on the line. How do we have productive, productive conversations with our friends and families about disinformation in elections? And can we actually convince them to stop sharing the disinformation or the deep fakes that they, we see them share at times? Kate, we'll let you start and then Seth follow up. Yeah, um, I think uh, it's, it's getting harder and harder to like convince someone um, uh, about potentially information or a set of beliefs that have been proven to not be credible. Um, I There are certain things that we can do to try to increase the probability that these conversations would be productive. Um, I think the first thing is to get uh, get out of a public forum. So as much as we, we love to have uh, conversations on social media <laughs> about uh, deeply held beliefs, um, I think most folks would would note that that is not always an effective medium for having those conversations. There's a face saving sort of uh, impulse that kind of takes over the desire to get to the truth when you're in a public forum. So I would say try to get that person offline or at least off of social media, um, maybe DM them instead of having a conversation um, on their public feed. Um, you know, finding common ground, understanding again that th that some of these uh, beliefs that might not be credible come from uh, the kind of fears and anxieties that we all have. Um, so there there can be a way to acknowledge those fears um, without uh, you know while still acknowledging that someone's beliefs might not be um, uh, credibly backed up. Um, and then you know there is research that shows that. Um, and I think Seth can go into more detail on this, but there's research that shows that um, presenting contrary evidence um, actually has the opposite effect. Uh, it will cause the person to uh, sort of double down on their convictions. So um, try to avoid the, the impulse to inundate that person with evidence. Seth? Yeah, as um, as Kate just mentioned, um, some research actually done by some graduate school colleagues of mine back when I was a, was in graduate school uh, show exactly what Kate just said. Right, that if you if you sort of sit someone down and simply show them and say, "Look, here are the facts," um, they they retrench. They the person's going to double down uh, on their mistaken belief. And again, I think that's directly connected to what Kate mentioned that sort of defensive mechanism. Um, so the best the best thing that I've ever seen um, is that you, know, you have to really approach with empathy and understanding. You have to first understand that that whatever whatever has led someone to believe a piece of, of disinformation probably comes out of a real concern that that person has. Most people don't want to believe things that aren't true. I mean, that's not that's not their point, right? That's not their purpose. They believe those things because, again, they they the the piece of incorrect information matches up with something that they are worried about or something that they are afraid about. Um, so, you know, one one expert who writes a lot about how to to talk to people says that the, the way to do this is to you have to sort of create a truth sandwich. You have to you start a conversation by expressing understanding of the concern. So, for example, you might say something like. I understand that you're concerned about mail-in voting, right? About the accuracy, the security of, of mail-in voting, right? Once you've sort of uh, uh, empathized with them and expressed that concern, then in the middle, 
of the sandwich. Uh, you tell them in the way in which their belief is incorrect. So you might say something like, well, Washington state has had mail-in voting for years. And in the 2016 general election, there were 74 cases out of 3.4 million votes, which is uh, a fraud rate of 0.002%, right? There's the piece of actual information. Uh, and then you sort of close the sandwich by reiterating the understanding. I get that mail-in voting maybe seems less secure, but there's really nothing to worry about, right? And by doing that, you've, you've, you've empathized with the person, you've sort of understood their concern, and then you have, uh, you've presented them with a new piece of information, but you've done it in a way that seems less, um, less challenging and less directly confrontational. And so I think that's, that's at least one way that you can try to talk to somebody when you know that that person is um, uh, producing or it has, uh, has accepted a piece of, uh, of incorrect information. Thanks, that was a great example. Um, turning turning uh, to a different topic just for a second here, and, and Kate, I know your some of your classes have, have done a little bit of work with this. Uh, how do you know if what you're reading is from a real person or a bot? Um, well, I think, uh, I think Seth actually has a lot of great information on this. Uh, one thing I'll say, though, is that, um, yeah, one thing I do with my classes when I teach about media literacy is um, we as a class create a fake news Twitter bot. Um, first of all, what that does, it sort of like shows some of the markers uh, that that is common in um, in posts that are that are produced by bots. Um, so th there'll be things like kind of a lot of exclamations, a lot of um, yeah, so a lot of sort of intense punctuation, like exclamation points or question marks, um, certain words, inflammatory wording, um, all caps sometimes. Um, and, and the other reason why I, I have my students use is, is just to show how incredibly easy it is to make a bot. Um, but I think there are there are certain patterns of speech um, that have been shown to generate sort of a lot of clicks. So I think a, a lot of the um, the the common sense uh, warnings about what we perceive as clickbait headlines can apply to uh, speech uh, that's created by by bots as well. Um, so applying some of those uh, some of those rules to it. Um, but I know Seth has probably more information on this. Yeah, uh, you know, some of the best estimates are that about 25 to 30 percent of the inner of the users that you would encounter on the Internet are actually bots. Right. So a large percentage of the traffic uh, are not actually real, real people. Um, and the bots are in particular driving, uh, pushing out, creating and spreading misinformation. If you look at, you know, a map of uh, sort of how information moves around and the reality of information, You'll see that basically what happens is information will get produced somewhere and then a bot will pick it up and push it out and that will sort of become the node that drives uh, the way that information moves around moves around the internet. Um, many of these bots come from Russia so when people are talking about Russian interference uh, in elections one of the things that, that Russia is doing are they have these sort of warehouses where people sit around and produce fake information and push it out through these bot accounts. Um, so how do you know when when something that you that you've come across is in fact by a bot? Well, I, I think Kate was exactly right. Right, um, you know, all caps, sort of exaggerated headlines, um, hyperpartisan memes, things that are right, sort of to the really far extremes, painting one side or the other uh, as as evil, as um, as you know, fascists or communists. Those things can often tend to be driven by bots. Um, pictures that make claims or that are that are that are intended to sort of support a claim that can't actually be supported by the image uh, i remember um I, I came across one that was a part of a black lives uh, uh black lives matter sort of anti-protest which was a picture of a car that some people were in that claimed that the car had been vandalized and yet there was no proof from the picture that it had been vandalized right and that was uh it turned it out that that piece of that that photo had in fact uh, been pushed out by a bot um, if you're actually looking at someone's account, if someone has sent you a friend request or whatever, um, you can look at their account. Is, does, is there personal information on it? Are there pictures of their families or their dogs or do they talk about their life at all? Um, if not, probably a bot. Um, if there are only political means there, probably a bot. Um, 
Are there actual news articles mixed in with memes? I mean, lots of people spread memes. Lots of people find memes really interesting. But is the account only memes or is it memes mixed with news stories and analysis and opinion and things like that? Um, there's a, There was a really interesting website uh, that was circulating around just a week or two ago called spotthetroll.org, which uh, allows you to look at several actual um, user accounts, some of which are bots, some of which are, uh, are real, and really is a nice way of, of sort of getting some experience and, and looking at sort of what a bot, what what about what, excuse me, what bot accounts might look like. The problem, of course, is that bot accounts are, are managed by real people uh, and they've gotten really, really good, right? And so it can be, it, it can be very difficult, but the sort of the hyper partisanship, um, uh, sort of exaggerated claims that can't be supported by whatever you know picture or evidence is, is there, uh, and again trying to scan for you know does this look like someone who's real or does this look like um, you know a bot? Uh, is there personal information? Those kinds of things can be really helpful in making that decision. Great, thank you. It's very interesting. I wish we had an entire hour just to talk about bots. Uh, there's a lot there. I think that's all the time we have for this segment. Thank you, Kate and Seth, for your time and participation. If our audience has any questions for either of them or for our journalists earlier, please leave it in the comment section for a Q&A that uh, we may have at the end of the event if we have some good questions. As a reminder, we have prepared a fact sheet that you can reference and share with others. It's printable. We're linking to it now in the chat. The URL where you can find it is thenewstribune.com slash spotting hyphen disinformation. We'll also share a link and a thank you email you will receive if you registered for this event. And finally, it is posted on all McClatchy Washington websites. Let's move on to session three and how technology plays a role in deep fakes or disinformation campaigns. Today, we have Ashish Jemin and Dr. Jevin West to discuss the topic. Jevin is an associate professor in the information school at the University of Washington. He is co-founder of the Data Lab and the director of the new Center for an Informed Public at UW. His research and teaching focus on the impact of technology on science and society with a focus on slowing the spread of misinformation. And finally, we have Ashish, who is the Director of Technology and Operations in the Customer Security and Trust Organization at Microsoft, focusing on the Defending Democracy program. Ashish is currently working on disinformation defense and deep fakes intervention strategy and its impact on society and democracy. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us and thanks for running the event. Nice, I appreciate it. <laughs> Ashish, can you get us started by telling us what Microsoft is doing to combat disinformation? Absolutely, Stephanie, and thank you very much again for the opportunity. But before that, let me actually tell you a, a great thing that we announced today. We, we made an announcement to support local newsroom journalism with technology tools uh, and, and capacity to expand the reach of your news, local news outlets as well as to fight disinformation. Uh, that happened today, and let me go to your question now. Uh, so we at, at Microsoft believe that this is uh, this information and, and synthetic media is a very complex problem, and it will not be solved by one uh, entity, be it a private entity, tech company, or civil society, or even government. Right? It requires a multi-stakeholder, multi-modal approach. Uh, and our approach has been actually multi-pronged. We focus on four key strategies. The first one is establishing partnerships which, with, with academia, research, as well as peer tech companies to understand uh, the social science behind disinformation, but also to also share signals and figure out what would be the right countermeasure. So partnership across the board. The second is uh, policy and regulation. So uh, trying to understand what right policies, platform policies, as well as regulations may make sense to combat this uh, menace of disinformation. Uh, the third thing we focus on is developing and deploying technology solution, right? At the end of the day, we are a technology company and we want to bring uh, meaningful technical solutions to market. Uh, and recently on, on, on September 1st, almost a month ago, we announced a couple of technical solutions, one for detection of deep fakes, uh, as well as uh, authentication and provenance to figure out authoritative source behind uh, an, a piece of information so the platforms can take action 
Uh, and these, these could be varied set of actions, labeling, uh, uh, providing more context or even removing. The last but not least, which we think is the most important if, or, or the effective tool to combat disinformation is media literacy. So we are working with Jevin and his team at CIP. Uh, we recently uh, released an interactive web-based experience uh, similar to what, what was talked uh, earlier, spot the trolls, we actually have spot the fakes, uh, which is a, a, a very interactive web experience in a quiz format uh, for consumers to be aware of uh, what synthetic media defects is uh, with a very simple goal to raise awareness and, and, and hopefully uh, for consumers and voter to, voters to become thoughtful consumers of media because we feel that even a short intervention in media literacy makes a bit, big difference, both in understanding the motivations of the perpetrator or the threat agent, but also to uh, mediate uh, the, the damage itself. Great, thank you. Chevin, can you talk a little bit about the research from the Center for Informed Public and your priorities right now in this contentious election? Well, our priority is to try to deal with this big problem that we're all facing right now, this misinformation, disinformation crisis that everyone feels across the political aisle. And what we're doing in this new center that was formed and actually launched in December of last year, it seems like a lifetime ago that we were at our inauguration and shaking hands and saying, all right, let's go get this misinformation thing. And then before we knew it, we were in the middle of a pandemic that was incredibly rich uh, in a bad way uh, of, with misinformation, so much so that the World Health Organization claimed on February 2nd that they were dealing not only with a pandemic, but an infodemic, something that researchers in this field have been talking about for some time. And it's not that this will be going away after the pandemic or after the election cycle or any other major events. This is something that's gonna be with us forever. Um, and so what we're trying to do at the university is establish a center, a program, a place where anyone, not just researchers, but journalists, librarians, teachers, the public at large, any place uh, or, or anyone can come to uh, the center to participate in discussions, to come up with solutions, to deal with some of these challenges that we're facing right now. And so we have four main areas of emphasis. We have research, which is our area of expertise. We study primarily social media data, public social media data. We track uh, rumors and conspiracy theories online. We look at the ways that ideas and people and influencers are amplified, especially during uncertain times like crisis events. We also spend a lot of time on the education front. As Ashish mentioned, we've been doing a bunch of work developing tools and putting out lectures. And my colleague and I just wrote a book on this. Um, we have, um, uh, we do public sessions, we do things with our high school teachers, we do what's called Misinfo Day. Uh, actually, high school teachers are doing a Misinfo Day Junior at their schools. So things are happening in Paci the Pacific Northwest on the education side. We also engage generally in policy discussions uh, at, the, at the state level and local level and also at the federal level. Um, we, as Ashish says, this is not a problem that is just a tech problem or just a legal problem or just a teacher uh, or media literacy problem. It's, it, it hits all of those things. And so I encourage the listeners to just engage on those. And then the fourth thing is community engagement. And so that's where what we're doing is we're trying our best to bring in um, digital volunteers and to engage all the different stakeholders uh, in the Pacific Northwest. And the, the one last thing that I'll mention is that we just launched a couple of weeks ago what's called the Election Integrity Partnership. This is a collaboration with Stanford University where we're monitoring in real time misinformation and disinformation around voter integrity specifically. So this isn't that something, this isn't misinformation about what Biden said or Trump said, this is about voter integrity. So there's a lot of misinformation around mail-in ballot dumping and harvesting and, and mail, uh, voter stuff, uh, ballot stuffing, et cetera. We're monitoring those things in real time and then getting it out to the public and journalists. And so that's something that people can engage with as well. You don't have to be a researcher. So those are all the different things. As you can see, there's just an infinite number of things that need to be worked on because it's hard to solve any of these really big problems like the pandemic if we don't get the information part right first. Great. Thank you. Ashish, you said something that struck me in, in previous conversations. You said disinformation is the new cybersecurity threat. How do we train ourselves to be critical consumers of media? And what tools do we need? 
So yeah, I've been actually thinking a lot about what we can learn from a cybersecurity uh, domain and bring it to disinformation. And the reason I, I think is because, you know, as we know, disinformation and, and misinformation hoaxes, you know, they have evolved from just being nuanced to really high stake warfare uh, to create social discord. Uh, you know, we've seen uh, disinformation to increase partner, uh, partisanship. In fact, uh, in some cases, even then uh, influencing the election outcome. And this is not just coming from nation state actors with geopolitical motivations, right? It is also coming from ideological true believers, a non-state violent extremist, as well as economically motivated enterprises. And the whole idea there is they're trying to manipulate narratives uh, with on social media with so much ease and unprecedented reach and scale, right? The scale is enormous. Uh, and so so I, I think that it's time for us to take a step back and instead of just thinking about this as a computational propaganda uh, around truth narrative, let's actually take, take a step back and start thinking holistically around, this is an adversarial attack on information system, right? So this is, and that's why I believe that info ops, right? Information operations are cybersecurity issue. And, and the point I want to make is we have seen similar attacks, like for last two, two and a half decades around the cybersecurity or the technology infrastructure. Uh, what we have done as an industry with public private policy, we have established information sharing analysis center, LISACs. We have collaborated and coordinated. We are sharing signals, not just with, between the, the tech companies, but with civil societies, with, uh, with, with the agencies, government agencies. And more importantly, what we have also done is from a media literacy perspective, uh, have invested heavily on cyber hygiene and literacy for consumers around cybersecurity issues. You know, everyone now at least have some basic understanding on on, on phishing, on you know viruses and worms and other threats on on for their machines, be it on your phone or and and what I want to think is let's learn from that domain on how cybersecurity has evolved from just responding, being reactive to being proactive, protecting, defending, and responding to cyber attacks. Let's actually bring look at this information with the same lens. And, and solve it holistically rather than just solving in silos and one one step at a time. Jevin, thinking about that as, as disinformation as sort of the, the new cybersecurity threat, do you think that media literacy is, is our, our best weapon uh, against that? How would you approach it? I definitely do. I think it's both the long-term play, the medium short play, I think it's every play. Um, uh, certainly we need to bring in lawmakers to see what flexibility and infrastructure we have in the legal sphere. We do need to involve the tech companies that have the keys to a lot of these systems and into the design decisions that go into social media and the other kinds of things uh, that are sort of attracting our attention to these disinformation campaigns and, and, and fake news stories. Um, but I think ultimately it has to come from making uh, us all better consumers of information. In your previous uh, session with Kate and Seth, I think they gave some fantastic ideas of how we individually can become better information consumers. And it's having discussions like that in schools, at town halls, in libraries, at the dinner table. We need to be making that a central part of what we all do. It's not something that we just have a 30 minute seminar, uh, you know, in the college orientation class. It has to permeate in everything that we do. And we're starting to see that to some degree at universities and, and a little bit also at the high school level. As I mentioned, there's a group of local teachers in, the, in, in Washington that are putting together what's called Teachers for an Informed Public. And if you're interested, please contact us at the center. I can put you in contact with the teachers doing this. And it's those kinds of efforts that will really truly inoculate us because there's always going to be some new strategy that bad state actors uh, are going to employ. They're adapting to the different rules and constraints that social media companies are putting on them. If they remove certain accounts, they'll just adjust and go to a different medium. Parlor now is a place that a lot of people, it's kind of the alternative to Twitter with less rules. There's all sorts of different ways in which um, you can throw design changes at them and algorithmic changes. Well, they'll adapt. 
So the only thing I think we can do ultimately is to train the information consumer to let them know these technologies exist. So when a new technology like deep fakes comes along, when synthetic media comes along, making people aware so they can make adjustments as an information consumer. We went through these stages, you know, in the 1990s when Photoshop came along and everyone at the time was talking about how the world is over as we know it and being able to discern when a photograph is true or not, we made, th we made it through it. And that was partly by educating the public, making people aware of these kinds of things. But so many people are still coming on the internet for the first time ever. And so it's those people especially that we need to give these media literacy tools to. But really it's a K1 to K99 um, uh, need of education. And that's where I think we need to go in order to really address this problem of disinformation. Thank you. Uh, we've mentioned policy a, a few times already during this, and I have a, a few great reader questions I want us to get to. Uh, this first this first one is from Pete, who asks, what will it take for social media platforms to become legally accountable and liable for the content on their sites? How likely is that to even happen? Do we think it will? If if we do, what, what sort of time frame um, do we think maybe, maybe it will happen? Um, Jevin, I'll let you start first, and then Ashish, if you have anything to add. Well, I'd like to say sooner, sooner than later. There's a lot of discussions around the uh, Communication Decency Act, Section 230. There's even hashtags now that just are exploding in social media called 230. So if you've never heard about Section 230, start reading it. It was this uh, uh, policy that basically gave immunity to platforms. They could put any, any content could be put on the platforms and they would not... Um, uh, be accused of any sort of um, sort of misdeed. This is they were sort of immune to anything, and that's that that has been a discussion point among policymakers. And there's good arguments for Section 230 and against it. But what's absolutely coming down the pipeline are discussions at the federal level around it. We're hearing that all the time. Another thing to be sort of thinking about um, are even older policies, like the the fairness doctrine, for example. This was a doctrine that was uh, um, established in the 1940s. Um, as a way of providing um, kind of a fair balance or at least uh, both sides of controversial issues with public interest. Um, this was mainly directed at radio stations at the time in the 1940s and television stations. And it stood strong for many decades until about the 1980s, it was removed based on, uh, on this idea that it was an attack on the First Amendment. And it's been gone ever since, but many scholars will point to the fairness doctrine going down as one of the reasons we see such polarizations. So there'll be discussions about the fairness doctrine, section 230. There'll be discussions about providing more, more of the onerous uh, on, on these social media companies to be in charge of their content. You can see them getting more proactive because they know it's coming down the line. So there's no perfect policy at this point, but to uh, answer this great question from, um, from the users, uh, listening to this, I, I think uh, we'll see that shortly after the election, no matter the result, we'll be talking more and more about the role that social media companies should be playing in controlling at least some of the content without invading the, 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 the sanctimony of the First Amendment. Ashish, did you have anything to add? Yeah, so I'll, I'll take a, a, a slightly different uh, tone here, which is you know, I'm not an expert on, 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 on the public policy regulations, but what I can talk about is how platforms are taking cognizant of the fact that they, they are part of this problem and trying to come up with their own policies uh, as well as norms. So, you know, you can see a, a lot of social media platform include, you know, you know some of us like LinkedIn, uh, has no tolerance for for defects we will not even we will remove it right away there are platforms like twitter who's who's taking actions of labeling de-incentivizing de users uh, you know facebook is is doing a lot around inauthenticated coordinated behavior on their platform and and most of the platforms actually have done uh, have have put out policies around elections and disinformation uh, recently so so again, to Jevin's point, I think we all are taking proactive steps. Uh, and and you know, from from my perspective, I think there are tools and technologies that the platforms actually can can build. There are policies that we can put together. Uh, and and at the end of the day, I also believe that you know, platforms should be actively thinking about uh, building societal resilience by media literacy on their platform, supporting media literacy as well as making sure that they do the right things to build that societal resilience. 
Great, thanks. I think we have time for, for one more question. We talked a little bit about bots earlier, but, uh, but Reader Kenneth asks, how can you tell if disinformation is from a foreign source like Russia? And, and I'll add on to that. Does it matter where it's coming from? Well, I'll take the very quick answer of saying it does not matter where it is coming from, be it internal or external. At the end of the day, we as, as, as consumers, as well as platform companies like ours, we have to make sure that we defend against disinformation attack, be it on our platform, uh, or, or any other, we have to coordinate, share signals, and make sure that, that the consumers are defended and protected from disinformation. And I'll just give a quick answer on top of that, because I know we have to wrap up. I would say that a lot of the attention has been on bad state actors, and there's good reason for that. But I would say that even more worrisome to me is just the spreading of the information that we're creating domestically. Um, the polarization and the hyperpartisan news network that we're living, I think, contributes far more um, than some of these bots. And regarding bots, we've done a bunch of studies just this summer, just internal studies, and found how difficult it is to automatically detect bots and to do it with humans. It's really hard. And a lot of the advice that was given to look out for bots were good, but we've just found it's really, really hard. And so I think that we just generally need to be looking out for this no matter where it's coming from as, as ashish is saying and i always i would also say let's look internally at some of our own uh issues and we'll see that a lot of it's just being spread and 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 pushed by ourselves that's why we always need to pause and 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 think before we share thanks guys unfortunately i think that's all the time we have uh thanks jevin and ashish and all of our panelists for your help today as individuals, we are up against a billion dollar disinformation economy. And while delivery mechanisms are changing rapidly, our best tools remain personal in nature. You can help others understand disinformation using the tools we discussed today. The one sheet is available at all McClatchy Washington news sites and in the chat. This session is being recorded and is available for replay. Thank you for your support for local news and please encourage others to become supporters as you are. Have a great afternoon and a safe and secure election.